uh, for this presentation of this is just, we're gonna look at the motivation of the use case creation. We're gonna look at where you can find these use cases as well as the input data that you're gonna work with um, to get these to run. And the great thing about MapPlus is that all of the data that you need to run these use cases are available to you for download. And again, I'll show you where you can find those. Um, the three use cases we're gonna kind of go over in a very iter iterative uh, manner. We're gonna start with the expected output that we got from the organization that tasked us with creating these use cases. Then we're gonna look at the input data description and inspection um, of what that looks like right from the terminal. Uh, we'll go over the configuration file and kind of what tools are called, what processes inside the tools are called, and how the tool is gonna run um, with those various configuration settings. We're we'll gonna look at the Python embedding. All of these use cases are gonna utilize Python embedding, but they're gonna do it in different ways. Um, so it's gonna be a very powerful tool to look at. Uh, then we're gonna run the use case in real time. I'm gonna have other terminals and going back to the uh, command line or to the presentation at certain times because these do run a long time. I think the first one runs for two and a half minutes. The second runs, second one takes about 10 minutes to run. And then the third one takes about a minute or two. Uh, so we're not going to watch it run or just sit silently uh, <laughs> and wait for it to run. So we'll bounce back and forth, and that'll be a good time to ask questions as well. Then we'll look at the output. Um, we'll take a look at um, if it matches up with what we expected the output to look like. I'll gather questions from the group. And then finally, after those three use cases are gone through, we'll go to closing remarks and get final questions from the group. So the motivation for this, uh, for these use cases to be created was a contract or a um, funded project we had with EMC to take their marine and cryosphere verification system and get it turned over into the MET Plus so that it could become an operational verification system. Um, EMC already uses uh, MET Plus as its uh, chosen verification system, but this was done outside via a lot of Python scripts. And as most of you will know, if you've worked with Python at all for verification, it's not easily rep replicable or repeatable. Um, it's, you can't trade things off. There's a lot of external dependencies. Um, there's just, you have to exchange code. It's not easily um, readable from top to bottom unless someone comments it very well. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to using something like that plus that makes it very conformable um, and repeatable. Uh, so we were tasked with creating uh, four different areas of use cases that ultimately land in those three um, circled areas. That's the fronts, sea ice, and the metrics. And more explicitly, that falls into satellite, cable, fronts, and sea ice. When you push those into MetPlus wrappers, we actually ended up getting seven different use cases uh, for potential uh, being made. And that's because sometimes... Uh, when you get to a category, for example, satellite, um, we're going to look and see that we are working with several different data sets. And while the MetPlus tools are very capable, more than capable, of handling multiple data sets at the same time via the forecast or observation fields, um, sometimes for a use case perspective, it's more useful if you have one data set that you're focusing on. You can chain them together. Um, and then run them all at the same time in parallel, if you'd like. Uh, but for a use case perspective, uh, especially from the data set size that you'll be working with, it's usually better to keep it small so that other people who will be able to uh, take a look at the use case, because they are held in the repository that are open to the uh, community at large, um, they don't want to download six or eight or 10 gigs of data. So sometimes it's best to dissect the use case or the bigger picture into smaller use cases that are more easily run um, by other people. So we end up with seven use cases and we'll take a look at most of those, but only focusing on three um, for this presentation. So again, the location, the use cases, all of these are located in the GitHub repository for the MetPlus wrappers. Um, I didn't circle it here, but right there at the uh, PARM level, under there you'll have a subfolder called model applications. And that's where you'll find a list of categories. And actually on the right side, which is the nice readable area of read the docs, you can get a list of all the model applications that we currently have. Um, we're going to be focused on the ones called marine and cryosphere right here, the 7.2.4.
And um, I very strongly encourage you to go through there if you're looking for um, an entryway to running Met Plus for the first time, or even if you're trying to get ideas of what tools you'll need to run your uh, your data through verification. If you can understand which model application yours would fit into, like, oh, I'm going to be working with Precip. If you click on Precip and you go through there and you see something that sparks um, similarity, or it's working with uh, radar data, it's working with certain satellite data that you know um, you're going to be working with as well, clicking on that will give you an idea of what the tools they used how they ran Met Plus, and you might be able to mimic the same thing in your um, your verification script. Uh, but as I mentioned, we're going to be moving through the marine cryosphere for this one. Uh, as for data, all the data is located at this URL, at least for version 5.0. And you can go very specifically to which um, use case model application category you'd like to download. So in this case, we're going to be at the marine cryosphere 5.0. Um, there's actually two. One of them is the save file. This was just an older version that was saved just in case we had issues. And then I think this one is the one you actually want because it's slightly newer. That is correct. So um, if you do want to download just for a specific category or model application, you can do that. You don't have to download all um, multiple 20, 30, or 40 gigs worth of data. Um, I full alert, um, the marine cryosphere is one of the largest ones at 7.8 gigs. So just be aware of that. But um, it is a very powerful uh, way of dealing with this, that you can get all the data at your fingertips and you don't have to really track down your own sources. So uh, the first one we're going to start with uh, in terms of categories was the fronts. And again, you can see that up here in the left-hand corner. We're going to deal with um, uh, trying to replicate modified Hausdorff and the 75th quantile Hausdorff metric distance. And there's a few things that we're going to have to look at for this and how this works. But the most important thing that I'm going to cover right now is just what the Hausdorff distance is. Uh, it's not necessarily a very common tool. Um, but this is just a very, a very basic rundown of what the Hausdorff distance is um, in terms of what it's doing for this. But you might be looking at this wall of text and wondering, okay, what does that actually mean? What is the Hausdorff distance? So I'm a very visual person, so let's quickly create this sixth grade representation of what the Hausdorff distance is. And mind you, there are different types of Hausdorff distance. I'm going to be covering the most basic one, um, but there are various twists on it depending on how you're calculating it and uh, what application it's going to be used in. So in this space, um, we're going to create a shape. In this case, it's just a two point. It's a shape represented by two points or a line, I guess, in this case. We're going to pretend like it's a bigger shape, but we're only going to represent the shape A with two points, with each point being labeled A1 and A2, and then shape B is going to be represented by three points, by B1, B2, B3. So the Hausdorff distance is you take, uh, depending on which direction you're going to use, in this case, we're going to look at the Hausdorff distance between shape A to B. So you're going to take every distance between point A1 to every point on B2, and you're going to look for the shortest one. And whatever the shortest one is, in this case, it's this one between A1 and B1, you're going to keep that and discard the rest. And then you're going to go to the next point of A. In this case, it's A2, and we're going to measure every distance, and you're going to keep the shortest one and throw out the other ones. The Hausdorff distance is whichever of the longest, shortest ones is that you have, that's the Hausdorff distance. So in this case, the longest, shortest distance would be distance between A1 and B1. That's the Hausdorff distance between A and B. This is going to be kind of an important idea to note because it's going to determine how we need to set up this use case, both on the Pythonic side as well as the MET Plus side. Also, it's important to note that the Hausdorff distance is not symmetrical. So if you're looking at the Hausdorff distance between A and B, as we're looking right now, that is not necessarily the same value you're going to find as the Hausdorff distance between B and A. So another thing to keep in mind. So looking at the data sets that we're going to use for this or that were used on the EMC side of things, we're going to very 
frequently use the forecast data, the global RTOFS data set. Um, that's, that's supplied by NOAA and it's in a net CDF format. It is CF compliant, um, which is great. That's the format or that's the compliancy level that MET needs in order to read it. Um, we're, unfortunately on the Python side, we're going to be reading in a lot of variables. Uh, we're looking at salinity, temperature, sea surface height, which is SSH, sea surface temperature, which is SST, um, your U component of the movement of water and the V component of the movement of water. And all of this is in four different dimensions of one of MT, which is just time, uh, 33 depths, 3,298 wide coordinates and 4,500 X coordinates. So we're dealing with a very large data set on the NetCDF side. Um, but the, the bigger problem comes from the resolution of the global R2FS data set, which is that it's a combination of two grids. Um, it's an Arctic bipolar patch north of 47 degrees north and a Mercator projection south of 47 north through 78.6 degrees south. So you don't have consistent grid spacing. That's a huge issue um, at the current moment in MET. Um, and it, we're gonna discuss that a little bit more for the next use case, but just keep that in the back of your mind that our forecast data is always on an irregular grid, um, which is always kind of a, not necessarily a non-starter. It just means you have to get creative with how you're gonna approach things in MET. Looking at our observation data set, we've got two files. We've got um, one that will hold the Gulf Stream and Loop current location, and one that'll ho hold the Kuroshio current. Um, that's supplied by the Naval Oceanographic Office, and it's in an ASCII format. Um, and it's a daily value that lists that has a list of points defining the current for a small region. And you have, again, these three different currents or streams that you're trying to graph and figure out. And from the forecast with the Python script, you're basically calculating where that stream is based off of um, temperature of the water, uh, the sea surface height, sea surface temperature, and the salinity levels at your 200 meters and 400 meters, um, which is, it's a lot of calculation <laughs> to say in the least. We're, luckily we were supplied with the Python script that already did most of that for us. Um, but ultimately you end up with streams or currents um, that are calculated at certain points. So your forecast goes down to just points, your observation goes down to just points. So we need to find, again, just like I uh, pointed out with the last Hausdorff distance, we wanna find the Hausdorff distance and the 75th quantile Hausdorff distance between two sets of points. Kind of easy to do in theory, um, but when we go into MET user's guide, we do see that it does have on the 30th column of the DMAP line type output, we see Hausdorff distances there, but unfortunately this is only available in GridStat, uh, which means both the forecast and the observation data sets need to be on a set grid that is spaced equally um, between all the grid points. So unfortunately this of coverage instead of currents, so we're not looking at points, we're looking at big areas. And as we'll see when we get into the data sets, we're gonna start working with grids. Um, so what exactly does EMC want replicated in this use case? Well, if you scrolled onto some of their other pages, I'll hit back here really quick. Um, on the statistics side, if you clicked on that, you'd get these nice little graphs at the bottom and you'd get uh, each of these different statistics output down the side. So we'll run through each of these as we go through them. So the weighted average, is just taking uh, you know, how much area of ice there is and then just averaging your value across that weight or applying the weight of the area that it's across. Um, if you go into the MetPlus configuration style, you'll see, or into the MetPlus configuration user's guide, you'll see that there's an entry called grid stack grid weight flag. Um, that coordinates to the MET configuration file setting of grid weight flag. And if you jump over to the MET user's guide, you'll see that that has three different settings. One that's none, which is the default, that's fine, that disabled the grid weighting, but we're again, interested in weighted averaging. We have a uh, cosine latitude, which is an approximation for the grid box area used by NCEP and WMO, that's great. Not quite what we need for this one. And then we see that area um, defines the weight as the true area of the grid box, which is your square kilometer. That's exactly what we're looking for. So MET plus already does this. 
um, on the back end. That's great. We're going to need to keep that in mind for when we set up the configuration file. Um, the next one we're looking at is the standard deviation. If we go into the continuous statistics or CNT output line type in the Met user's guide, we see that column 61 through 65 is reserved for the standard deviation of the error, which is actually what this is. Um, and then we can see that the, the later columns of 62 onwards are also for the confidence limits, lower and upper, and then the bootstrap upper and lower levels, which is great. Um, we're only, in this case, going to be interested in the standard deviation. So column 61 is going to be great for us. We see that there is a MEP plus wrapper configuration setting called GridStat Output Flag CNT that's going to control this. And it coordinates back to the MET configuration of output flag.cnt. So that's great. And as you go down this entire list, you'll see that every single one of these is actually located in the CNT output format. We've got mean error, which is just your forecast minus your observation. We've got root mean squared error. We've got our Pearson correlation coefficient, which after we dug into the Python code that was calculating this, it was the Pearson correlation coefficient. And last but not least, we have the scatter index which is, again, uh, columns 122 through 124, all still in the CNT. So on one, um, in one setting, one line type output, we can very quickly get all the statistics we're looking for. And for those who are interested, the scatter index is just the ratio of the root mean squared error to the average observation value. And this is um, actually, I think, the definition from our MET user's guide. So again, if you ever have a question of what these things are, um, you can find a very brief explanation for how this is calculated and what it's looking at. Um, but the bigger question is that tab that we saw on the previous page and I brought over here is the difference. So we want to see the difference between the forecast field, the RTOFS field, and the observation field, which is the OSTIA. And again, we'll dive into what exactly those look like as data sets. But um, the important parts to know, we want to know the difference between these two fields in terms of size and shape. Um, so if we go to, again, our MET Plus user's guide, we see there's something called a GridStat NC pairs flag diff. Um, and on the MET side, it looks like this inside the configuration file. Then we see something, again, called diff equal true. NC pairs flag is can control the NetCDF output that's available to GridStat. And we'll see on the next page why GridStat is the right choice for this. Um, but suffice it to say that this option is available as a NetCDF output from GridStat tool, um, also accessible from the MetPlus wrapper around GridStat. Um, the quick and easy understanding of what each of these means I highlighted here. It's just that the lat, lon, raw, and diff entries control the creation of output variables for the latitude and longitude, the forecast and observation fields after they have been modified by any user-defined regridding sensor conversion, and the forecast minus observation difference fields, respectively. So there it is. There's our forecast minus observation difference fields. So that'll be diff. So we can control that as well from the MET Plus side. So everything seems to be replicated on um, MetPlus that we're finding in that Python code, which is great. Um, if we go and look again at the forecast, we see the same R2FS file as before, except this time we're looking at only one variable field. It's called ice coverage. And it's only dependent on three different dimensions instead of that depth that we were looking at before with current. We're still dealing with two grids matched together. We're going to take a look at that on the next slide, what that looks like. Um, the observation field. So this one is going to be the grist, uh, which I believe is, I always mess up on this. Um, I think it's the group of uh, high resolution sea surface temperature, um, the Global Foundation sea surface temperature analysis. So this is actually provided by the UK Met office. Most of them are provided by, I believe, NOAA. Um, but this specific uh, level of data is from the UK Met Office. It's also a CF compliant net CDF. We're looking at a different variable field, but still across three different dimensions. Um, and we're dealing with a consistent 0 0.05 degree or about five and a half kilometer at the equator resolution. Um, so at least on the observation field, you can read that in very quickly and very easily. Um, however, when you get to the forecast side of things, we have an issue. So we're going to look at the data after we take a look at 
this real quick, which is an actual representation of what that RTOFS grid spacing looks like. On the left-hand side, you can actually see that representation. It changes um, in that 57 or 58 degree north region. And we have a, a bipolar um, area or, or bi-coordinate system up here. And then just an equal spacing thing that slowly starts to decrease in size down here. Um, so nothing's really consistent in terms of grid spacing on this grid for our forecast data. And if we go into the supported map projections listed in the MET user's guide in the back, we can see that all of them that are labeled there are currently equal spacing grids. Um, if you try to pass this into something like plot data plane, you're going to get this error coming back at you where it says MET can only process latitude longitude files where the latitudes are evenly spaced. And it'll tell you exactly what the issue is where it started to go south. And you can see that the D latitude of 0 0.03 here with a change of 0 0.033. So it's just, it's finding a mismatch of an issue. And then it tells you, please check the input data um, is the lat long projection. And unfortunately, that's a current limitation of MET. Um, it's, it's being worked on so that we can get around that. But it doesn't mean, again, that you're closed off to what MET can do. It just means that you're going to have to change how you go at using MET. So I'm going to actually stop sharing this screen, and I'm going to share the whole screen now so we can take a look at our data. This one, share. Okay, so these, this particular use case is going to be the RTOFS OSTIA use case, um, ice cover. So if you're looking for the particular name inside of, uh, inside of the MET Plus repository, it's this. I'm actually going to increase the size of this because I'm worried it might be a little small. There we are. Okay, so we've got our RTOFS data here. Um, which is nice and labeled. And then we have our OSTIA, which is from the UK Met Office over here. So taking a look at that RTOFS data first, we're just going to do a quick NC dump on it. We can see um, our ice coverage is up here. Um, we can see a little bit of the double. It's a float in terms of ice coverage. All dimensions I mentioned in that table are, you know, it's an unlimited, the 3298, 4500. It's very consistent in terms of what we're going to use for our forecast data. We see the global attributes, the conventions fit the CF 1.0 level. Um, originally, this institution that um, provided before was processed by the UK Med Office is NCEP. Um, and it was pulled from the HICOM archive file. So great things to help us in here, including if you ever want to play around with this, you can, but you can't do it with the plot data plane, unfortunately. But this is, it's a good opportunity um, to look at data uh, at this level when you use the NC dump because it gives you usually, especially when you have great global um, global attributes like this, you can quickly see like, okay, is this a consistent spatial resolution? In this case, we're dealing with a 0 0.05 degree data. Um, we have, uh, we've got our sea ice fraction. It's smaller. We're not dealing with nearly as many data sets. Um, it's a little bit more finely um, resolution in terms of what we're looking at. And this one, we could pass into something like plot data plane and it should be able to give us a good representation of what's going on in there. Um, and if you are ever playing around with MET for the first time or MET Plus with a new data set, strongly advise you um, to use Plot Data Plane to see if you can at least get the data appearing in a very simplistic way inside of MET um, so you can understand what's going on. Uh, so uh, let's quickly bounce back to here. I'm just going to leave it on uh, this level because we're only going to be in here for a second. Um, so the tool that we need, I can, I can make this a little bit bigger. Here we go. Um, the tools that we're going to need are grid stat. As we saw, um, both fields are on a grid. Um, observational wise, we can get the observation data set directly into grid stat without any Python processing. But the forecast data, because it's inconsistent on a grid space, 
we're going to need to get a little creative with that. And that's why we need to use Python embedding because we have that irregular grid of the forecast and we need to get it regridded over to something a little more standard, something that has set um, differences between the grid points. Um, and we're actually going to get it on the same grid with our Python script. We're going to get on the same grid space as the observation data set and then pass it into uh, Met Plus for all the statistical processing. Um, as we saw, um, we only need the CNT statistical line type um, because everything that EMC requested is on that line type, except for the difference fields. Um, in this case, we're gonna we are not gonna request the net CDF, although um, in the presentation you saw we could do that. That's because there's also a separate application of Met Calcpy and Met Plotpy um, that this particular use case utilized. Um, where we want to mimic this exact same output. So if you try to do the net CDF output or a plot data plane, once you get that field difference um, plotted, what you'll get instead of the um, fixed north res representation of you know looking down on the Earth, you'll get something more along the lines of this, where you're looking directly at the equator where the line is fixed here, and you'll just see this really thin strip across the north edge, um, which doesn't really, um, it doesn't really represent the data all that well. You'd rather have a north, um, a north facing uh, representation of your ice field. Last but not least, we have a few notes, which is we need to get the north and the south pole regions. We can't just ignore um, one whole region. And we also don't want the in-between. Um, we're not interested in anything that's happening around the equator or anything that's really happening below about uh, maybe 70 or 80 degrees latitude. It's We're much more interested in the things that are north or extreme south. And as we noted before, we need to get that forecast field into the spacing of the observation field. So that's going to have to happen in our Python script. So um, just as I stated before, we're going to quickly run through configuration file and tool process. We're going to review the Python embedding. We're going to run that use case. It's going to take about two and a half minutes. Um, and then we're going to take a look at the inspected output and uh, see if it has everything that we were looking for. Um, are, at this point, before I jump into the terminal side, are there any questions? Uh, hopefully everything's been answered in the chat, it looks like. So there's one from Ben that says, what does NC pairs refer to? Just trying to understand the naming convention a bit better. Yes, um, so the NC pairs is just referring, I think that you're talking about the NC pairs flag um, dictionary. Um, the NC pairs is just uh, the net CDF paired data. So you're looking at where the forecast observation fields have been matched. Um, and you have for every forecast observation grid point, you have an observation grid point that matches to it. And it hasn't been eliminated by um, thresholding or bad data sets. All right, thanks, Ben. OK. So um, let's jump on over and take a look at this data. Uh, let's go to this one instead. So um, this one I have also set up. I'm just using um, the Met Plus 5. Point, I think it's 01 uh, release. So all of these things are available in the latest stable um, recommended release of the Met Plus wrappers. So if you want to take a look at them, by all means, you absolutely can. Um, so we're going to jump up into Met Plus. Arm. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the uh, configuration file because that one's going to be very simplistic. Um, the great thing when you use um, model applications to start from, uh, our engineers have done a fantastic job of going through and eliminating the superfluous settings. You're not going to find a lot of things that you don't need to run it. Um, and this one is no different. I'll show you what I mean when we get in here. Um, so in this case, usually if you go into, for example, the Met Tool wrappers um, use cases, which gives you a very basic understanding of what each um, tool looks like once it's wrapped with a Python on the Met Plus wrappers side, 
you'll see a load of options and a lot of configurable settings. But when you go into the model application side where someone's actually running this against real data um, to get uh, verified output, in this case, we're literally just trying to mimic um, EMC's verification, but on the Met Plus side, you'll see so many, you'll see so much less um, configuration options. And we're going to be looking at, um, Ben, you asked, where are we in the use case right now? So this, uh, this is the configuration file um, for the GridStat Forecast RTFS OBS OSTIA ICE cover. You can see this either in the repository, um, and that's what I'm, I've got it downloaded through Git, um, but you can also view this through the read the docs. This does, um, this configuration file does have, does appear inside the read the docs um, use case explanation. So you can view it from there as well. Um, so for right now, you can see that we're only using GridStat, as we said before. We're only going to do one loop. In this case, we're going to be set on March 5th um, for one day. But we are going to take advantage of the fact that we can set a custom loop list. In this case, we need something from the north and the south. So we can reference this um, with the tag custom. And every time that this configuration file is executed every time it runs in this case it's going to run twice the first time it's going to pass in north for wherever you called that custom tag and then it's going to pass in south for the second time it runs we go down to the input template for the forecast and observation um, input files we're calling python numpy so we're basically telling met hey get ready instead of a file name that i passed you i'm just passing you this keyword which is going to inform it that when we get down to the forecast field name or the forecast variable name and the observation variable name i'm going to be passing it a python script along with all the output that we need um, the output directory is just set to the output base that's controlled by my personal uh configuration file. We'll take a look at that before we run this. And then note that the output template relative to the output directory is going to be the valid time. So we're going to need to look for a folder uh, labeled with the 2021-0305 relative to the output base uh, to find out where this output is. Um, this is not running uh, once per field, aka we're not, or it's not running with, if I had listed uh, three or four different variable names and three or four levels for each variable, it's not going to run all of these combined together. Instead, it's going to run them one at a time. Um, the model here is the RTOFS. Um, we're doing an ob type of the UK Met Office, the configuration directory. Um, and this is just to save us a little bit of typing space. We typed it here. It's based off of the parameter base, which is an uh, internal setting to Met Plus. And then you can see we refer to this configure right here in the forecast var one name. And it saves us about 50 or 60 keystrokes. So we don't have to type this whole thing out. If you ever come to a situation like that when you're writing up these use cases where you're finding yourself writing an extremely long um, title, go ahead and take advantage of the fact that you can set internal variables here and then call them with the brackets. Um, it'll save you a lot of time. It'll probably clean up your configuration file um, a lot better for you. So here we're calling on this read ice data Python script. We're going to pass it a, the input file for the RTOFS. We can see it over here. Um, and we're also going to pass it at the same time um, for running. We're going to pass it the UK Met Office or the OSTIA uh, data file as well. Uh, we're going to pass it that custom flag in here. So it's either going to be north or south, depending on which run it is. And then we're going to also pass it a final flag, which tells our Python script if it's supposed to be sending back a forecast or an observation field. Um, as we stated in the presentation, we do not want to regrid this to grid. Um, this is going to be done on the Python side because our forecast field is just an irregularly spaced grid. So we need to take care of that ourselves, and we don't really need um, grid stat to do it once we get it in the format we need. Um, but that is an option here if you do have equally spaced grids and you find I'd rather move them to a third party uh, grid so that it's neither the forecast or the observation field. You'd rather have it a third one. That's fine. You can do that inside of grid stat. In this case, we're not going to do that. Um, but we do want that grid weight flag. We're going to set it to area. 
Um, we do have the output prefixes custom. So again, our file names themselves are going to include um, north or south. That'll very quickly tell us if the file we're going to open, the ASCII file or the NC pairs flag, um, is going to be a, uh, if it's going to be the north pole or if it's going to be the south pole. And then we've also requested that the CNT line type is um, out in both the stat file and as an ASCII file. Um, so we are going to very quickly read. There we go. Let's quickly go through the Python script. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one because uh, as we go through more and more use cases, the Python scripts are going to get more and more complex. Um, but understand that we really um, this is where you can get very creative on your end. And this is why Python is um, is your friend when it comes to uh, potential road blockage um, with MEP+. Plus. If you have something you want done in MEP+, Plus, you still want to run inside this verification system, you still want other people to repeat what you can do um, very easily with configuration value, you can do that while combining it with the power of Python. Um, unless uh, it's already something that we're working on. If we are trying to do your grid um, natively through MET, you might want to just wait. Or if you just want it done really quickly, you can do it yourself um, in some pre-processing with Python embedding. Um, so most all of these codes um, that you'll see today are have all been adapted from Todd Spindler during his time at EMC. Um, it's going to read in the RTFS and OSTIA data. It's going to uh, you know, mask out the regions that we don't want in the middle, and then it's going to re uh, reorganize the grid spacing on the forecast side to the observation side. Um, so we can see that we're getting the ice area here. Um, we're going to pull in the files, all the uh, things that were passed in at runtime for the forecast and observation side on grid stats. So we're pulling in the RTFS file, the ice file, which hemisphere we're working with, north or south, and then whether or not we need the forecast, the observation pass back. Um, it's going to open up the RTFS file, the OSTIA file. Um, it's going to mask out the arrays of latitudes and longitudes. We're going to do a quick shift from negative 80 to 180 to 0 to 360. Um, you're going to mask out things below 15%. Um, we're doing that in the Python script just because we're trying to replicate as closely as we can the behavior on the EMC side. Um, but note that you can do um, field thresholding on the MET side as well, on the MET plus side. Um, so if you want to set a threshold for your data and you want to ignore all data below a certain level, you can absolutely do that as a threshold. But since it was already calculated here in the Python script, we just left that. And it's also, I think this is done before we ever um, get it on the same grid space. So we don't want to uh, do the thresholding after the fact. We'd rather do it before we do the regridding. Um, so here we're doing our um, defining of the grids and getting them set up with the KD tree interpretation or interpolation. And then uh, we can combine the mask of the two regions. And then we look for that, uh, that file flag. If it's the forecast, we're getting this little Pythonic metadata um, dictionary ready so that we can pass all of this into Met and it understands what's going on. Um, and if it's the observation field, we do a very similar thing, setting up this dictionary and passing it back um, to MET plus so that it can run. Um, so that's everything. We've seen the Python script. We've seen the data. We've seen the uh, configuration file. Now it's just an issue of running. Um, so we're, like I said, we're going to run this. Um, we're going to let it run in the background because it's going to take about two and a half minutes. Um, and then. If you have any questions, uh, we can discuss those then. Otherwise, we'll just move on to the next one. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll be taking a bio break in about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so don't worry if you have the need to get up and stretch your legs or grab a cup of coffee or something of the sort. i be able to see the end of this. Okay. Then we're going to pass it my personal configuration file. Okay. 
So uh, you'll, I don't think you probably saw it unless you had really keen eyes and you were looking. There were two things that I did set up before I did this, and they should be noted um, if you're attempting to run this. In the Python script at the very top, you saw a bunch of dependencies of Python libraries that were required. Uh, on my side, I just created a Conda environment, or I'm using the Conda environments that are set up on our system on Seneca um, that have all these Python dependencies already preloaded for various use cases. In this case, I'm using ice cover. Um, you'll see that once we finish, um, you'll see the Conda environments called ice cover, I think V5.1. Uh, so that has all the Python libraries that I already set up, and it's a great way of keeping these things organized. Um, each group of use cases were required slightly different, um, and you are more than welcome to create one giant um, on an environment that has all of them or break it down into smaller ones um, so that you're not having to be responsible for all those interdependencies. Um, and then additionally, I did set the met Python exe um, to Python 3. And that was because if you tried, if I currently just let it go where it is, it runs into a dependency issue, goes down a different path in terms of what Python I want run, and it can't find those um, those libraries even though it's loaded up with the con environment. So another thing to keep in the back of your mind to make sure that you're executing the right Python version on your system that you're expecting it to, especially if it's installed in a common area. It's very common that if you're accessing a MET installation that's in a common area, it will um, it might behave differently than you'd expect in terms of uh, what Python it touches. So um, while we're waiting for this to run, are there any questions? Are there any issues anybody has? OK, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump into the next one. We'll come back and take a look at the output as soon as we're done um, and get a feel for that. Um, let me go back to sharing just this window so that we can see it a little bit better. Go. OK, so. The uh, the next area that we're going to look at is the satellite. Um, so this it gets a little bit more complex than what we were looking at before. Before we were just looking at sea ice coverage. It's not super complicated, um, but it it's just a very straightforward observation to model. Now we're going to get a little more complicated because we're look at different um, fields as well as different uh, data sets to look at those fields. So we're going to, like I said um, at the beginning, sometimes when you look at your own verification work, you're going to smash all of these into one configuration file. That's fine for your own purposes. That's good. Um, for ease of use or ease of use case rep, uh, replication, it's usually easier to divide these into separate groups, which is exactly what we're going to do. So when we look at what EMC is pulling out in terms of verification work, we'll see our old friends again of the mean, the root mean squared error, bias, um, cross correlation, or in this case, correlation coefficient, and the scatter index. Good news is we already know we can do all of those. That's not an issue. The issue is, again, that we're looking at four different fields um, and we're using different data sets for each of those. So let's just quickly walk through uh, what those data sets look like and what they're going to be required uh, for the various fields that we want to evaluate. The first one, as we can see in this upper left-hand corner, is this is sea surface salinity, or SSS. Um, forecast field, you probably don't even need to glance at it anymore because we're still working with RTOFS data. Um, in this case, for observation fields, we have two. We're going to be looking at an SMAP, which is the eight-day mean. Um, and I believe that is the soil, uh, soil moisture active passive. Um, so that's an eight-day mean that's provided by NASA. Um, it's still CF compliant. We're looking at the variable fields that does have altitude attached to it, but there's only one altitude. So it's, it's almost a fake out. But it's something to pay attention to when you're setting up your um, your use case that you'll be responsible for one more dimension of this field. Um, and we're looking at a quarter degree resolution or about 27.5 kilometers at the at the equator. Um, observation data set two is the SMOS or soil moisture and ocean salinity. 
um, data set. This one's provided by NOAA. It's again CF compliant. Um, we're dealing with the exact same resolution, the exact same dimensions. Um, and then this time we've introduced a new factor, which is climatology. And the climatology is going to vary depending on what variable field we're trying to analyze. In this case, we're looking at sea surface salinity. So our climatology is going to come from the World Ocean Atlas. Um, it's still CF compliant. Um, we're looking at the T analysis field. Um, that's got a time depth blatt and lawn. And we have 57 depth dimensions that we have to work with. So again, something that you have to keep in the back of your mind. Now, the good news is that all three of these are on the same resolution grid space, but um, you can basically just ignore it because our forecast is not on the same one. So we know at least at a bare minimum, we're gonna need to use Python embedding to get this um, changed over to the observation fields and climatology. Um, the sea surface heights, um, we're only gonna use one observation data set for that one. Uh, it's gonna be from the CLS, uh, which is a French organization. Um, it's still CF compliant. Uh, we're still only dealing with three dimensions. It's at a quarter degree resolution, um, like the last ones were. Um, our forecast, again, for sea surface height of SSH um, is still RTFS. Um, I got to change that to sea surface salinity. But um, the sea surface height is exactly the same in terms of dimensions. You're still dealing with time, a Y, and an X, um, and the two grids smashed together. Um, this time, though, you're looking at a different climatology um, data set. This is from the Naval Oceanographic Office. This is the HICOM uh, ENCODA global 1 12th degree reanalysis. And similar to how the forecast is a mismatch of two different grids, this one has a 0 0.08 resolution between 4 degrees south and 4 degrees north and a 0 0.04 degrees poleward of those latitudes. So you're dealing with, again, a non-traditional grid where things are going to vary in space. So this climatology and this forecast are both going to cause issues if you try to feed them into MET plus directly. So something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, the last one that we're going to be looking at is the sea surface temperature, or SST. Um, this time we're looking at, again, the RTFS. We're looking at the variable field of SST. Um, we're going to be looking at the, the high resolution sea surface temperature, or um, the very high resolution um, OI global blend sea surface temperature analysis from NOAA. Um, all of these things you'll note are CF compliant things, again, get a little more complicated if they are not CF compliant. You can very easily make them CF compliant on the back end, but you might not have the time um, to go through and pre-prepare your data uh, for that. But it is something to keep in the back of your mind for that if you plan to feed this into MET Plus, that's probably going to be an error right away. Um, there's just going to be certain things that MET won't pull out. You can force it um, to treat a net CDF as a CF compliant, but there might be errors when you do that. So again, something to keep in mind. Um, this time our climatology data from World Ocean Atlas is going to be 57 depths, 720 latitudes, 1440 longitudes. So we're at a slightly coarser resolution than our observation data set. So now we've got um, three different uh, resolutions of data and uh, one of which is our climatology and working with multiple depth values. So um, for our purposes, we're going to take a look at the sea surface temperature um, because it's going to show a slightly more complex uh, variation of what we just saw with the ice coverage. But it's not going to be as complex as something like the sea surface salinity um, where you're going to have to blend in multiple uh, data sets in a very complex way. Uh, before we jump over to that, I'm going to pull up our data set because I'm assuming, yep, there it is. Uh, MetPlus has successfully finished running as me, which is great. Um, you can see that our output, out uh, the out directory, um, we can find pretty quickly with this command. We see that it, it, oh, you know what? We are not sharing this window, are we? Yep. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Thanks, guys. Um, entire screen. Keeping me honest. All right, there we are. So um, we see down here that MetPlus has successfully finished running as me. Um, this this output is, I think, new to MetPlus 5.0. So that's kind of nice, especially if you have multiple batches running. You can very quickly see when they're finishing. 
Um, but this last command is kind of my quick, quick and easy way to find out where I'm supposed to be looking for my output because it just gives you the run of what you just did. In this case, I'm running grid stat, passing in Python NumPy for both the forecast and observation data set. I passed in the wrapped configuration and it's telling me that I have an out directory right here. So if I go into output and 2021.0305, um, we should see, there it is. So there's our output. We see that we have the CNT text file, we have our stat file, and we have our pairs. And we see that actually we have six of them. And this is why that prefix um, using the custom looping option was so important because we can very quickly see, okay, these are the North Poles right here. These three files are um, coordinating to when we ran things on the north side um, with our Python script. And these three right here are to the south. And that's great. Um, it, it means that you're not monkeying around, opening up files, being like, is it this one? Is that one? And I have to do, you're not having to do long listing to figure out which one was created newest or last. Um, it's just very quick and easy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and show you the NC view of the North Pole. Um, so you can understand why, at least in this case, we wanted to do something with uh, metplotpy. Because when we open this up, um, we can see that there's a few, uh, there's three variable fields. In this case, where we have the forecast, the observation, and the diff. The diff is what we wanted. This is the difference between the forecast and observation fields after um, your conversion and thresholding has been applied. If we go here and magnify this a lot, because we're at 1 to the 20th. There we are. We can see that it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, if you if you are just looking at this, you might think that maybe you're looking at the pole. Um, but realistically, it's it it's not as useful as if we were looking from the top down. So instead, we're looking at the globe if it's cut um, along a common longitude and uh, looking at it sprawled out, which is great for when you're looking at land masses, not so great when you're looking at poles. Um, so that's why it's important to make sure that you have your end idea in mind and kind of work with the other MetPlus analysis um, tools available to you um, so that you can get things like this. Um, for the purposes of time, I'm not actually going to go into the MetPlotPy side um, and plot this out, but this particular one is available over in that tool or in that suite. Um, so if you are interested, go ahead and look for this one and you'll be able to um, open this up and put this out and see it in the exact same style as um, uh, as EMC created. So uh, also very quickly, let's go ahead and jump into, we're gonna go back to the north and we're gonna go look at that CNT file. Oops here and we can see things like 0.33 for root mean squared error or mean squared error is 0.109 um, the mean absolute error um, is 0.168 um, we've already i've already gone through when these use cases were created and did a one-to-one -one comparison between emc's python script and um, grid stat calculating this out and we're looking at um, thousandths of a difference and usually like 0 0.01 at the biggest um, usually you had three to four decimal points of no difference um, before you saw anything. So these are extremely close. And the only difference um, that we're, the only reason why we're seeing the difference is the back end calculation um, on Todd's code um, that we were originally presented with was obviously executing in Python and Met's basis C. Um, so the, the rounding errors that they're finding are going to be slightly, slightly different. And for the purposes of this verification, the amount of accuracy between the two was more than sufficient, which was great to see. Um, and it's just another highlight of, you know, if you use these trusted systems in MetPlus, you can rest assured that they are going to replicate what you're looking for. Um, I see that we are at the top of the hour. Um, I do want a quick push through. Um, to get that next data set running so it can run while we're uh, while we're on our break. Does anybody have any issues if we do that? Um, we should be done or getting that running in about five minutes. So hopefully you all can hang on for five minutes and we'll be um, going on that break. Um, let me quick um, pull up the data set because that's what we were going to do next. 
Um, for this new use case, um, the one that we're focusing on for sea surface temperature, um, you can actually see it here. It's the grid stat obs, uh, where is it, uh, grist. Um, and then it has now our climatology of WOA, and we're looking at the sea surface temperature. Um, this one's getting a little more complicated. So instead of just our input for forecast, input for OBS, we're now seeing five files, which is a little wild. Um, and you'll actually see one of these files looks very familiar. Um, that's because we need something that's going to mask out the ice region. We'll get to that in the notes in a minute, especially when we look at the Python script. Um, for the sake of time, let's quickly just do an NC dump header of our um, GRIS data. You've already seen the RTOFS one, so there's no real need to dive into that. Um, but here we can see that we are again finished, uh, fixed to the CF 1.4 conventions this time. Um, we can see that there's plenty of data in here for you to work with, along with the dimensions that we were looking at before. Um, and we also see kind of where these things are fixed to, you know, 90 to 90, negative 180 to 180. Um, so as you're looking at this, this should give you an idea of what your Python script's going to need to look like for to get your forecast field into your observation field in terms of grid resolution. Um, and then if we go and look, we see that we have two actual um, uh, climatology fields. And that's because when you're analyzing this particular field, it, depending on what day you're passing in, if you're passing in on the beginning of the month, you'll only need one month. If you pass in the end of the month, you will only need one month. But if you pass in the exact middle, um, it will need to do an average of the two. And since that's the most complicated use case you can get out of this is if it's passed directly in the middle, that's the, that's the one we're going to try to replicate here. So uh, if we just do a quick NC dump on one of those, uh, I think it's a four. Um, the five is very similar. It's just a month removed. Um, but we see all the different analysis fields that are available to us. And we see right here is our um, analyzed mean fields for the sea water temperature. So that's exactly what we're looking for for climatology. Um, and then again, you can see the different dimensions that we're working across here. So. Um, very quickly, uh, let's go back to our presentation over here. Uh, let's jump over here. Um, so looking at our data sets, we saw that we can probably get away with grid stat again, um, just because uh, our forecast, observation, and climatology are all in grids, although not necessarily the grids we want them to be. So that's why we're going to use Python embedding. Then we have irregular grids for both our climatology and our forecast. So we're going to need to get everything on the observation field and pass that all back to grid staff for analysis. As we saw before in the last use case, again, we're only going to need to request the CNT statistical line type output. We don't even need a difference field this time. We're only interested in the sea surface temperature, which the difference field doesn't provide as much verification information. But we do need to accommodate climatology files this time. We can't just go in and expect uh, the forecast and observation field to be enough. We also need to mask the ice, aka the pole regions. And that's why we have that fifth file, that UK Met Office file in there, because we want to mask out the regions uh, to the north and the south, because we're only interested in the sea surface temperature in the middle. Whereas before, we were masking out the middle region and only interested in the North Pole and South Pole. So we're kind of doing the inverse with this use case. Um, again, very quickly, let's jump over to this one. Uh, we'll back out very quickly. There we go. Um, I'm going to show you the configuration file. Um, but that's not, again, it's it's very bare bones um, in terms of what it's showing. It only shows you exactly what you need um, to run the use case. Uh, so green, let's go grid stats, forecast, rest, season temperature, there we go. Okay, so this one's a little more complicated in the sense that now we need to pass in a climatology file, but that's it. That should be the only difference we really see here. We're still only calling grid staff in the, in the configuration file. Um, we're running one time. That's it. I mean, we're we're not doing any kind of lead sequencing. Um, the only difference is here um, that we're now having to put a file input output 
we're not just doing the forecast observation fields of Python NumPy. We're also doing a climatology mean file that is also calling Python NumPy. Um, again, output directory and the template are the same. Um, we're changing the obs type to grist. We've got the configuration directory, which lets us save, again, about 60 keystrokes each time we need to type this in. Um, but this time, we're going to pass, we're going to call that Python script. This time, it's called read rtofs grist woa. Um, we're going to pass in our forecast file. We're going to pass in the observation file. We're going to pass in our ice masking file, which is that UK Met Office from the first example that we saw. We're going to pass in the directory uh, for the climatology because, again, we're going to have two different climatology files and the system, the Python script, needs to figure out which one it needs. We're not going to pass both. Otherwise, that would get very complicated. Um, we're going to pass in the valid time that we're running. So this could be run for multiple times. And then we're going to give it a flag of what it's expected to pass back. In this case, we got forecast, observation, and then if we go down to the climatology mean field, we're going to have the climo flag this time. Um, the, the only difference that you need to be aware of is how we call on the Python script for the climo mean field, instead of just a very straightforward one as we're doing here, you do have to have the brackets and treat it almost like you're calling it directly from the command line. Um, so you're going to pass in the name um, with the quotes around the exact same thing you put here um, with the respective flag, then end that, put your semicolon here, and then put the level in this case. When it comes back, it's going to be in a lat long coordinate setup. Um, so it'll be all set there. Down here, um, it's a very similar setup that we saw before, sea surface temperature prefix with a flag CNT of both, just like we saw before. So no real surprises there. Um, the Python script, again, as we go through more and more of these, I'm not even going to get very descriptive because there's just a lot going on. Um, as I mentioned before, but now you can see it up here is all the dependencies that we're going to need. So when you run through these, um, these use cases, you will want to get that. There is an area in the MetPlus user's guide that lists all of the um, library dependencies um, for each of the use cases. Um, so you can get them very quickly there instead of running it and then finding, oh, I need Pi resample. Oh, I have a dependency on panda, pandas. I have a dependency on x-ray. Um, we do have a table that contains all that information. I encourage you to go look for that in the use, MetPlus user's guide and just use that to set up your con environment beforehand. We're pulling in all the files that we passed in and the directory for the climatology. Um, we're going to read in the observation and forecast data, which it's in a tripolar coordinate um, setup, even though um, it's it's a mismatch of two by uh, RTOFS's own admission. Um, the climatology WOA data is going to determine which file it needs to look at, depending on what day was passed to it for the valid date. Um, and then we're going to read in that ice data for masking. So pulling it, pulling out the poles and only being focused on that equatorial region um, with, you know, about 40 or 50 degrees on either side. Um, and then we've got um, the grid getting that into the right area. We're masking everything out, reconciling um, the mass with the obs. And then depending on what that, uh, what that flag was, um, passed at runtime, forecast, observation, or climatology. Uh, we're going to get the data set ready in virtual memory to pass back to GridStat to run correctly. Okay, so um, thank you for bearing with me. It was actually 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run this um, while we're all on break. Are there any questions? Okay, um, so let's go ahead and take a 10-minute uh, break. I only have one example left, so it's not going to take nearly as long. By the time we come back from that break, this should have finished running. Um, we'll go over the results. If you had developed any questions while you were on your break, by all means, um, go ahead and let me know. But uh, let's come back at about 10.20 Mountain Time, and uh, we'll, we'll meet from there. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started back up. Um, the use case that I ran while we were at break is still running. So we're going to jump into that after we review the uh, third use case, or I guess just before we look at that data. Um, thanks again for everybody sticking on. Um, did anybody have any questions before we launch into the last use case? 
kind of cover that. Again, seeing as what time it is now and how much material I have left, we're going to have about 20 to 15 minutes um, of time at the end. So if you don't have enough time or you feel you don't have enough time to ask a question, don't worry, you will have more time at the end of this. So. All right, um, with that, I'll cut the camera. Um, I'll come back on at the end, uh, but let's launch into the uh, final part of this presentation. All right, so um, where are we? I just wanna make sure this is, yep, it's showing, cool. Um, so where we last left off, we've got the last use case. It is the global RTFS Florida cable transport analyses. Um, so in this case, we're going to be looking at the uh, Florida cable transport or for Florida cable flow uh, rate um, from West Palm Beach on the west side here to Eight Mile Rock out in the Grand Bahamas. Um, and it's important to note here, the blue circles are the RTFS global grid points sample. What does that mean? Because <laughs> um, it's really a, it took me actually a, a hot minute to figure out what we were looking at for this use case. Um, I'm going to have to walk you all back to your physics 201, 202, um, kind of discuss what's, uh, what we're looking at for this use case. So it's a pretty basic um, understanding that when you put charged particles through a magnetic field of any kind, you'll be able to see or measure a perpendicular electrical field. Um, and that's no different than when if you pass ions of seawater through the magnetic field of the Earth, you'll actually be able to measure an electrical field. Um, so in this case, the electrical field that we're observing is actually through this underwater submarine cable um, that's flowing between the west, um, from West Beach in Florida, all the way to the Grand Bahamas. Um, so the because of the behavior of seawater, um, some of the principle or some of the properties of seawater, you don't need to measure everything in the vertical. They actually short out in the vertical um, charge, and you can measure at any point, and it'll be a vertically averaged horizontal flow. So if we put a cable in, essentially this Florida cable, we know how the electrical field varies. Um, through that, because we can directly measure that. We know approximately what the magnetic field strength is of the Earth at that point. And we have an idea, or we have, we don't have an idea, we know exactly how charged that ion is in the seawater, because that's a constant. We can actually calculate how fast the Florida current or FC is going through that cable. That's incredibly important because it contributes to the growth of tropical cyclones and tropical genesis. Um, it's important to migratory animals in the ocean. Um, it'll affect how fast they go or how fast they're transferring different areas. Um, it's actually got an impact on uh, climate change. Um, because we can determine how fast these things are going and we can that's also impacted by the temperature of the water um, so measuring how fast that flow is going and having an idea of how well we we forecast this is actually incredibly important to a lot of areas of science um, so it's kind of cool that we can we can do that um, it is important to note that on the emc side of uh, this uh, script, they were taking in, I believe, 21 days of data and then doing a seven week average um, of that data on each side um, and giving, uh, giving your verification data for that. Because that data set was so large, we slimmed it down for the use case to three days. Um, it's still a lot of data. I think it is probably one of the largest use cases in terms of data input. Um, but it, it significantly pared down the amount of data that we'd have to package up so that you could test it at EMC's level. That does not mean you can't increase it, and we'll actually look at the point in the Python script where you can increase the number of days um, that you'd like to look at. It just means that the data that we supply you, um, if you go our route, will only account for three days of averaging getting out. Luckily for us, um, we see our old friends here in the verification statistics, bias, root mean squared error. We already know these are available in MEP+. We don't need to tinker around to find them. They're all in 
the CNT line type output. Um, looking at our data sets, we're again working with the RTOFS, although it's getting a little more complex. Our variable field is now going to be the U and the V, and we have on those core, uh, we have on those variable fields, we have the additional dimension of depth. And that's because, as we saw in that original picture, I can back up real quick. Um, we saw that we are going to be sampling at 16 different points um, from the RTOFS grid. Um, to calculate what that flow rate is. We're going to find an average flow rate for all of this. Well, we're going to find a flow rate for each and every one of these. Then we're going to average it across, and we're going to compare that to what was measured. Um, and that observation data set that we're going to compare it to is the FC, or Florida Current Cable Transport file. That's provided by NOAA, AOML, um, and it is an ASCII file. It has a daily value that's measured, and it's averaged, again, at 16 set sample locations. So we're going to replicate that exact same behavior on the RTOFS forecast side, and then we compare it. But as we saw before, um, or as, as you're now thinking about it, the resolution, we've got a grid, we've got our observation, which is in point data, but we're going to need to get this gridded data into point data to get one average value. So the calculations on the back end are probably going to be a little more complex than what we've worked with before. We're not just doing um, a, uh, a masking region. Um, we're not just doing a um, an area average. We're doing something that we're doing our own calculation to find these things. Um, additionally, we're going to see when we go into the observational data set um, that we're dealing with units of sverdrups, um, which is something that I needed to learn about because I'd never heard of it before. But it's a 10 to the 6th meters cubed per second um, measurement. So we'll see that when we get to the observational data set. Um, I'm going to stop presenting here so that we can take a look at the bigger screen. There we are. OK. So I think, yeah. Um, so bouncing back uh, very quickly, we're going to switch gears. Sorry for the, the jarring change. Um, but our previous one that was looking at sea surface temperature, that use case just finished. Um, at, true to my word, you can see that uh, this took about 10 minutes and 38 seconds to run. So it's one of those things that you set it and forget it. Um, we can see that from our command, again, that cheat sheet line. Um, here's what we ran, again, passing in the Python numpies for our input. So it's running our script. Our output directory this time is going to be 2021 -05 -03 instead of 0305. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to go to 2021 -05, 05. There we are. And we should see that we have our sea surface temperature. There it is. We are not requesting a um, north and south because we were only focused on the equatorial region, or I guess the you know the broader equatorial region. We weren't interested in the poles. It's the way of saying it. Um, and then if we go in there and check out just the CNT line type output and not the stat file. Um, you can see that we are looking at reasonable values. Again, these were compared to what uh, EMC was doing with directly with Python script, and we found insignificant um, differences in terms of the values, which, again, is very reassuring to see. And we do this with all of our use cases. When they're brought in, we make sure that they can replicate the behavior that is expected. These are not just, oh, it's close enough, let's just let it go kind of things. That's great. Um, let's bounce over and take a look at the data set for this RTFS Florida Cable Transport. Um, so we're going to back out of this area. This time we're going to actually be, um, this is a little spoiler alert, we're going to be using user script. Oh, uh, that should not be in there. There we go. Um, so for this one, we see that we have an RTOFS directory. We're going to see that that has three different days. Again, we're looking at an average across three days versus the 21 days that we were looking at with a seven-day average for those 21 days. Um, the only difference here for the RTOFS data that we're not going to look at because it's the exact same file that we looked at before is that now instead of looking at um, a single field, we're going to be looking at the U and the V field, which are in separate files. So that's why, again, this is one of the largest ones because you can't find the U data and the V data in the same file. You can do that on your end, 
um, if you want to combine them and make them smaller, but we try to keep this as native as possible. So as close to what you can find when you download these data sets as you're going to find. Um, if we go into the eight mile cable file, um, this is going to be our 16 different locations. You can see that we have an exact pattern of the two, um, two identical, I think, latitudes, um, changing longitudes. And then we've got about five or six latitudes that were different and then the changing longitudes. They're just the sampling points of where um, the cable is sampled from to find out the flow rate there. Um, and we're going to use those exact same points on our RTOFS data um, to get the average from our forecast. And then let's jump into the FC cable transport file. Again, this is going to be a file where it's going to be updated. I think it's updated every day, um, but usually it's you can find it more easily put out every month. They'll update with the previous month's data. And you're looking again at that Sverdrops or Sverdrops um, value here, which is just your flow rate of the Florida current. And then for every day of every month for a year, you're going to find what that flow rate is. And ultimately, this value is what we're trying to get with our forecast data. So we're not looking at something that's um, grid to grid. Um, we're looking at a single value that comes from 16 different values um, from our gridded data. So it's getting a little more complicated in terms of what we're going to need to do. So if we jump back here, and we just uh, increase the size of this. There we are. So we saw our data set. So now we've got cable transport. What do we need for this? Um, grid stat doesn't really make sense since we need to pull our forecast, which is in an irregular grid, off of that grid and average it across the 16 specific points that we're looking at, calculate the flow rate for each of them, and then average it. Um, that's, that's a heck of a lot of behind the scenes um, computation. So it makes more sense if we just use our own Python script, but call it and execute it from MetPlus. So in this case, we're going to use a user script. Um, most certainly are going to need Python and Bang, not just from the regular grid, but the specialized calculations. Um, output this time, we're going to do it from our Python script. We're just going to do output of text. Um, so even though, if we go back to this one, we were interested in these four calculations because that's what the Python script did before. Um, and in previous examples, we stopped our Python script from doing it. We let Gridstat do it for us. Now we're going to let the Python script in user script um, do the calculations for us and put it out in a text. So we know it's going to be one-to-one, -one, which is great, but it's still going to be within the Met Plus sphere, so you can do a lot more with it. And you can also do it in tandem with other things. So you're not doing your one-off and doing 80 to 90% of your other work in Met Plus. So it can all still be in the same environment, which is great. Uh, we need to select pre-designated points from the R2FS grid for calculation, as I mentioned before. We need to intake multiple days. Um, in this case, it's just the three instead of the 21. And we need to read in the several different ASCII files for both the grid points of where they're located, as well as the observational data set. So um, with that in mind, we're going to go take a look at use case three the exact same way we did before. We're going to look at that configuration file. Uh, we're going to look at the Python embedding script. Then we're going to run the use case, and we're going to take a look at the output. Let's jump on over to this area here. So let's look, take a look at that configuration file. This one, again, now we're only calling one process list, but this time it's user script. We're only going to need to provide the beginning time. The valid increment goes to 24 hours, but we only need to provide the beginning time because we have this uh, runtime frequency, which we're setting to run once. We don't expect this tool to run multiple times. You can change what you need to do um with this setting if you need to run that script multiple times but then you'll also need to supply a different valid time in this case we're doing three days average to one 
Um, so we're, we're not going to need to run the script more than once. We do provide the input template as your valid beginning. Um, and output director, we set it at this time to model applications, marine cryo, and our calc transport. And then we have our user script command. So instead of um, trying to pass this in via a keyword of Python NumPy, this time with user script, we expect to run a Python script. We expect to run something outside of MET plus. So in this case, it's already set up to take our command. We're calling this file and then we're passing in the user script input template, which in this case is just the valid beginning. Um, in this one, we're getting a little bit more um, crafty. We're going to set up your environment so that when you're executing the Python script, it already has all of these user environmental variables ready to grab instead of passing them in a runtime. We're not going to do 15 or 16 different inputs. It's just going to be set up for you. But you do have to utilize this, um, this heading area. Usually, you're only responsible for one at the very top called config. Um, but when you're using something like user script and you want to have access to um, the user end bars, you'll need to set that up yourself. Um, so in this case, we're going to put up the RTFS directory name, the cable file name, the eight mile file name, and our lead time. In this case, it's going to be 24. Um, we are also going to pass in the number of days that we're calculating. So this is where you can control them. Again, the operational website uses 21 days, but we're only used three. Um, but you, can, you could tweak the code slightly and then just update this to 21 days. And then suddenly you can run with a full, um, a full operational verification aspect. Uh, in terms of the text file output, we're going to put it out in this calc transport.log file. And it's going to be located in the output directory, which the user script output directory is already listed up here. So um, that's kind of it for the configuration file. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that Python file. Again, because this one is doing all of the calculations, it's doing all the um, the flow rates for the forecast. It's getting it averaged across. It's reading in our ASCII files. Um, this file is, or this Python script is a lot more complicated. Um, luckily, it's it's labeled pretty well. It tells you exactly what it's doing in different areas in terms of, you know, transport data from MAOML, doing the full cross-section transport calculation, um, retrieving model data. Um, so it does a good job of telling you what it's doing, but in terms of the complexity, it is a little bit um, more than what we've seen with the previous Python scripts because, again, we're not letting... Um, grid stat or point stat or any other MET plus tools do the calculation. Eventually, it's going to take in all of the files. It's setting up the logging. So again, we're putting out this text file to get ready to put the output to. And then we're calculating the differences, the bias, the root mean squared error, the scatter index, the correlation coefficient. Um, and then we're, we're writing that out to that output file, and we can see what it should look like down here, what it's printing to that file. Um, and that should be it. Um, we'll go ahead and run this one. This one's going to be a little bit faster um, just because it's you're working with a lot less um, grid points, and it's all being done by the Python script. And um, after this, I am open to any questions that we have. OK. So uh, are there any other questions? Um, Great question, John. Um, it is actually a subsurface current. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what the depth is. I think that's either, it's somewhere in the script, I believe. Um, it's listed what that, that depth is, uh, but I wasn't able to immediately find it. But I do know that it is not, um, it is not a surface evaluation. Yep, no problem. OK, um, are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just jump through my last slide. We'll come back and take a look at the output. And then we are going to be released early if y'all don't have any other questions. 
unless people have other questions related to Met Plus in general. That is also true. Ah, uh, I saw the the telltale pop up, which is good. Um, so again, I love love this little guy down here. It tells you successfully finished running. Um, we can see the command is here. And again, we get our little output or log name, user script output sent to here. So if we go into uh, outputs, model applications, marine and cryo, uh, it should be under calc transport. There it is. And if we jump into this text file, we'll see exactly what it said, what it threatened it was going to put out, which is um, the bias, the root mean squared error, correlation coefficient, and a scatter index. Um, so it's, again, is a great um, tool if you want to stay in the Met Plus while also getting very creative or maintaining um, your complex calculations um, without having trying to cookie cutter them into the Met Plus. Um, let me just jump back in here and then just go through this last one. So again, closing remarks on my side. That does not mean that we're done. Um, the we did see that there's multiple methods to ingest irregular data sets. If you see something in your data set that is not a regularly spaced thing for the time being, Met's going to have an issue. But that does not mean that you can't use Met Plus. It does not mean that you are stuck. Um, it just means that you're going to have to use the power of Python embedding. And there are so many use cases right now, um, three of which I just ran through, that demonstrate how you can use Python embedding to get that irregular grid into a regularly spaced grid um, and perform potentially uncommon calculations like we saw in that last one with the calculating transport. Um, we saw that a common forecast source can be set up with changing variable fields, and we can also change the observational data set. Um, from NetCDF that are CF compliant that you could just read in directly with MetPlus all the way to ASCII files. Um, there's there's nothing really that has to change too drastically to get those into MetPlus. There was actually only small, especially between the first two, between the sea surface temperature and ice coverage. There was very little in that um, configuration file that changed. The only thing that we updated was we now ingested um, climatology files. Um, but we were still calling the same exact Python script. So you do the work once, and you get to use it three times. Um, it's it's a it's it's an awesome uh, opportunity to limit the amount of work you have to put on yourself while still maximizing your verification ability. And then lastly, as we saw in that first op option or opportunity with Hosdorf, new statistics and capabilities are being worked on and added continuously. This is not a static. Um, dead language. Um, this is something made of real people trying to find what works for the community. And we're trying to build this into our system to help you meet your end goals. So I strongly encourage you to work with us. Um, if you have use cases that you want to get into MetPlus, contact us. We'd love to work with you to get those use cases up so other people from the community can use them or so that you can use them later on. And we can also check on our end as we continually update MetPlus that your use case is going to consistently work with the updates. We're also, like I said, the GitHub is open to everybody in terms of coming in there, taking a look and seeing what we're going to be working on, what the project boards are going to be showing in terms of um, new capabilities for that newest version. Um, go ahead and take a look. Um, if there's something that you think would benefit you or your group, your verification one, reach out to us in discussions and see if it's something that um, we can work on. Um, and with that, that is it for me. Um, are there any questions? Um, again, as Tara pointed out, we can have generalized questions as well. All right, sounds like a very satisfied or a very tired bunch. <laughs> uh, Tara, do you have any uh, closing remarks? I just wanted to say um, thank you to everyone who has participated in um, this, uh, you know, three and a half 
um, tra training sessions. Um, and uh, we are looking at doing, you know, more advanced topics in the fall. Um, I believe we're getting all of the funding put into place for that. So there, um, a lot of the, the focus in the fall will be on um, not only looking at advanced topics, um, you know, more, um, more emphasis on, you know, looking at more Python embedding, how to use climatologies and, and so forth, but also I'm um, trying to zero in on a couple of different topic areas. Um, one of them is um, the use of MetPlus to look at um, extreme events, especially in the areas of like fire and um, fire weather and, you know, precipitation events and, and so forth, um, and then climate um, and, and um, subseasonal to seasonal prediction. Um, so uh, we will be um, sending out an announcement in sometime in, in the mid-July um, to early August timeframe for the um, when the next um, series of advanced topics will um, start taking place. And in the interim, um, if you have any um, you know questions, feel free to reach out to us at on the discussions board. If you um, you know are really interested in, in what you've seen so far, but you feel like you need to go back and and learn the basics, you know we do have a full um, 20 hours of, of training sessions, um, you know on our website um, that are the basics uh, that should uh, help you better understand how to um, use MetPlus uh, and then be better prepared for um, the advanced topics in, in the fall, um, if you're interested in doing that. And uh, I think that that's pretty much all I wanted to say at this point. Um, any last comments, questions, or um, important details that anybody else wants to bring up? Okay. Well, then I guess everybody gets 12 minutes back in their day. So enjoy and thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody.